You know, I used to be a science teacher in the public schools in Australia. And one of the first science lessons I taught, one of the students said, Sir, you're a Christian. That's right. Well, you believe the Bible, but that can't be true. We know the Bible's not true. Uh, why is that? Because of what our textbooks teach us about ape men and about evolution. What I found was, when I was a teacher, that there were students in my classes in the public school who thought that they couldn't believe the Bible and they weren't prepared to listen to the message about Jesus Christ because their textbooks told them that they evolved and therefore, in their mind, the Bible wasn't true. And one of the things that I started to do then was to help them understand that evolution has not been proven by science and actually, when you understand observational science, it actually confirms the Bible's history. Have you ever heard this? Billions of years ago, there was an explosion in space, or 100,000 years ago, this happened or that happened, or even in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Question, how does anyone know? I mean, was anybody there to observe it? Well, actually somebody was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Check this out. First of all, we need to recognize that there is a huge difference between observational science and historical science. Both are valuable, but very different. Let's define the two real quick, shall we? Observational science is simply when we observe something and experiment to draw conclusions. It involves repeatable experimentation and observations in the present. It's through observational science that we find cures for diseases and build space shuttles, stuff like that. Now, through historical science, we consider things that happened in the past, but they cannot be checked in the same way. I mean, we don't have access to the past like we do the present because, well, it's gone, right? All we really have is speculation, or at best, circumstantial evidences of past events based on what we see in the present. That's not to say that we can't make intelligent guesses about the past or form reasonable inferences from rocks or fossils in the present, but we certainly cannot directly test our conclusions because we cannot repeat the past. Got it? So, does that mean historical science is unimportant? Not at all. Let's drop an example down here for a minute and take a look at the Eiffel Tower. You know, that 19th century Parisian monument designed by Gustav Eiffel that stands 1,063 feet tall, which was built as the entrance for the 1889 World's Fair and is still the tallest building in Paris today visited by millions of people each year? Yeah, that one. Well, guess what? Everything I just told you is true, but how do we test it? Well, applying observational science, we can, of course, observe the Eiffel Tower anytime we're in Paris. It's here in the present. Then, we can continue by testing the height and comparing it to all the other structures in Paris and confirm the claim that it is indeed the tallest building in Paris. But that's the extent of the kind of facts that can be proved by observational science in reference to this claim. How do we really know that Gustav designed it? How do we really know it was built in the 19th century as an entrance to the 1889 World's Fair? How do we really know how many people visited? That's all in the past. It can't be repeated. For that kind of information, we need to go outside the limits of observational science and discover what has been communicated to us through historical documents and eyewitness accounts. And furthermore, we have to believe those eyewitnesses and documents are trustworthy. The same is true when we talk about the origin of the Earth. The Earth is here. We all agree with that. So, does observational science confirm that the world was created by God, and are there trustworthy documents and eyewitness accounts that confirm it? Well, let's take the last part first. In short, what we're really asking is my original question, was anybody there to observe it? The answer is yes. God was there and he told us how he created. He inspired people to write down his very words that became books that were compiled into a complete book called the Bible, which has been verified over and over again and has demonstrated itself to be totally trustworthy in all it claims and teaches. Even secular scholars will concede that the Bible accurately records historical events. Anyway, we have the most trustworthy revelation from the most trustworthy eyewitness. Now, what about observational science? Does it confirm the Bible? Yes. And what's extremely important to realize is the observable fact that the universe is logical and orderly. That makes sense only if its creator is logical and has imposed order on his creation. It doesn't make sense at all if the universe is just an accident of a huge explosion. Also, our minds are able to comprehend many things about the universe, and that's only possible if the creator of the mind gave us the ability and desire to explore the universe. It doesn't make sense if our brains are byproducts of chance because we couldn't trust their conclusions to ever be accurate. And lastly, it only makes sense that we can observe and repeat an experiment if the universe consistently obeys the same laws from day to day, which only makes sense if a lawgiver created it that way and upholds it. So to be bluntly honest, science itself, whether observational or historical, is only possible because God exists and the Bible is true. I could go on, but enough said. And one of the verses of scripture that 
I've had at the forefront of my mind has been 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, always be prepared to give a defense or to give an answer. Uh, you know, I've been asked many questions over the years, like where did Cain get his wife? What about the races of people? How do you explain dinosaurs? What about carbon dating? What about the millions of years? What about the Big Bang? How do you explain the so-called races of people? How do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? Who's heard those sorts of questions? Have you heard those sorts of questions? Oh, yeah. Now, I can't go through all of them, but I'm gonna go through a number of them to show you, as a Christian, we need to be able to give answers and defend our faith, and we can. And it's exciting because God's Word is true. So let's start off with uh, the first question here. Is there any evidence for an infinite God? That's one of the questions I've been asked. How do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? And to answer this question, we're gonna start by looking at that molecule of heredity that I'm sure we're all familiar with called DNA. You know, the helical structure of DNA was first discovered by two scientists called Crick and Watson uh, back in 1953. Well, you know what, young people? We know today that scientists have studied a lot more about DNA, and we've found that DNA is not just chemistry. Let me explain that to you. Here is a rope that has beads on it, beads representing dots and dashes. By the way, those dots and dashes actually spell out a word. It's the word help. How do I know that? Well, you only know that if you know the Morse code. If you know the Morse code, if you know the language, then you know that those dots and dashes actually spell out a word. But those dots and dashes don't mean anything to you unless you have the language. DNA has these beads, molecules, lined up in a particular order to write all this information that builds a human or builds a dog or builds a cat or builds an elephant or whatever. For instance, you're made of trillions of cells and in nearly every one of your cells, you have all the information that builds you. It's been estimated if you were to type out all the information from one set of your genes, from one of your cells, it would fill, they used to say a thousand books, 500 pages each, close type written. Now they say it's much more than that. And here's the interesting thing. That information is not in the molecules. The molecules are arranged in a particular order to write the information. Just like when I open up my Bible and I can read it, but the information I'm reading is not in the molecules. The ink has been arranged into letters and into words and into sentences. And because I understand the language it's written in, that's where the information uh, really is. But here's the interesting thing. You've got to have a language to read the information. And DNA itself has the information that makes the language to read the information, that makes the language to read the information, that makes the language to read the information. You get the idea? In other words, you've got to have the information, but you've got to have the language. If you don't have the language, then you can't read the information. It's all got to be there or it won't work. It's all got to be there at the same time. And you know one of the things that we found out? Languages only ever come from an intelligence and information only ever comes from information. DNA cries out that there's an intelligence behind life. It couldn't have happened by chance random processes. Matter on its own could never produce DNA. But if life evolved, matter had to produce DNA. But that could never happen. I want you to watch one of these short videos we have from the Creation Museum that helps explain this a bit more. If you found an ancient clay tablet with strange characters washed up on the shore, you couldn't read it, unless someone had cracked the code. But you'd still know the letters represented a language, even if you didn't know anything else about the author or his civilization. Language is recognizable, even if you can't read it. Take Morse code. It has three basic parts, dots, dashes, and spaces. These three simple parts are combined to represent letters. There are 26 letters in the English language, which are combined to form over 400,000 words. Those words can, of course, be combined into an infinite number of sequences or sentences. There is evidence that DNA represents a language. Four basic units, called nucleotides, combine into a code for 20 amino acids. From those few amino acids, the body forms more than 100,000 proteins. Even if you can't read DNA, it still has all the hallmarks of language, a language that biologists are just now beginning to crack. Every tiny cell in our body is packed with three feet of DNA, three billion nucleotides. The similarity between DNA and human language is uncanny. 
In addition to codes, both use similar techniques to pack, access, rearrange, copy, and translate information. DNA seems to represent a language, the language of life. An unseen author, the creator of heaven and earth, has left a testimony of his existence in the DNA of every living thing.